where we came from. White people voted for this democracy. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't, Sissy. No, they didn't. Yes. A handful, in, a handful, in, a handful. In, did any of did you vote ANC in 1994? I'm not talking about the ANC. Please listen. In 1992, white people had a referendum to decide whether they're going to allow the vote. And we gave the vote because we thought that what was it happening wasn't was yours wrong. to give. Do you acknowledge that? It was not your country to take in the first place, but we acknowledge the fact that you are here. We acknowledge that you are here. Welcome back to the big debate on racism. A black South African can expect to receive approximately 13 cents for every rand received by a white South African. That's up one cent since 1994. Some of those workers paid the least are domestic workers, cleaners and gardeners. Vets University has outsourced some of these workers to save money. Let's speak to one of them. Yeah, Kibarakala University is outsourced. So I want a treatment that is one thing to one channel or about to judge a judge about. I mean, if you're like a racism, I'm a Tom Tamil like an equality, a long one ago in visit. I mean, if it's Osana Labat was a civilian, Bagalang, one thousand two hundred rand or two thousand rand Takahuidi, which means I own a Korean SMS of Tabans. In VCT, even Kawiona, I engage or I net our Levatoban to. In, in, in order what is a civilization mm. in if you if you can come for now. Okay, so ni pataloga ngu ingu futi and ni kwa zungena kwi toilet is onge as a university and ni kwa zungena as a library. No, library ababu ababu mele but what's an account library special as a as a civic or as outsource. Mm. But previously, halwasa du mele even to buy a good toilet, good good toilet, to buy a water to buy a civic toilet E1. And racism is a mention and you can eat. I'm listening to everything that's been going on. And everyone is talking like us, you know, like, you know, the coloreds. No one is talking about us. We, the black people, are being oppressed. Oh, there's white poverty. No one is talking about the white poverty. And I think the issue is re resources over racism. Everyone thinks that there aren't enough res resources for me. And what happens, even if you look at, like, uh, other countries, I uh, look at Greece, for example, look at Russia, the moment they, they experience a recession, what happens is that they start attacking foreigners. Of course, the, there's a resource problem. Mm. But in essence, the whole question, why can't we just get along, sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya? <laughs> it is all about power. Who has the power? And yes. power is not only whether you have political power. It's whether you have economic power, yes. Resource, yeah. Whether you have social power. If you have a white skin in a racist society, you have more social power. And it's a nasty concoction of things that makes it very difficult for people to come together as equals. Now, so are you admitting then that by virtue of having a white skin, that you have a level of power that I, with my black skin, wouldn't. I do, I, socially. For example, if I, go, if I go into a shop, I know that no matter if I come from the gym, if I go to the gym, and I'm dressed scruffily, nobody's going to assume that I am somehow up to mischief. If I'm a black person and I go to the same thing, people are going to assume it. I wonder whether we're willing to seed our eyesism, our colorism, our Indianism, our blackism, our whiteism, our Africanism, in the interest of an African identity, which is something that I think is far more compelling than the kind of silos that we are trying to construct. I think that there's no getting away from the fact that the project of apartheid was very linked with white capital expansion. I think it would be more useful to frame our conversation around rather affirmative action, corrective action, because what are we doing? We are correcting what has gone wrong. Reconciliation is not just about, mm, I'm so sorry, I love you, you love me. No. <laughs> All right, Sinead. Embracing your African identity, please speak to that first before you make the other points. Yes, absolutely. We started this conversation with regards to the Rainbow Nation. There cannot be a rainbow if we do not embrace the fact that we are several different cultures, we speak different languages, we have different traditions, and that was the plan, is for each of those to be preserved so that together it will be a really nice picture. But it all just became one big grey mess and majority takes everything. And you cannot deny that. You cannot deny the fact that 
tribalism is alive and well, and I actually think it's a good thing. I mean, Zulu people have, they own 37% of Natal in the Ingonyama Trust, and nobody knows that the Zulus have an entire homeland in the brand new South Africa. But let them have it if they want, but then give it to us as well. I want to stay with this point about the rainbow and everybody having their own peace. And maybe you want to speak to that because you want to raise the issue of the koi. Yeah, I just want to start by saying a question. Did the rainbow nation fail? It was never successful because it was never reality. You see, since Codessa, this was a black and white talk. You've, you've sidelined us. So are you saying that there were no colored people, no koi people around the table no, at Codessa? We, we, we are not included. We are not even like, like it's here. No, they were well, there. You, see, you have There's seats. A... You have seats for sir, whites and blacks. Sir, could we stick with the topic, please? At Codessa, there were colored people. There were people of koi descent. No, this is not a rainbow nation. We are the rainbow nation, the ones who are being pushed aside. The rest is a zebra nation. Uh, Teresa, I want to go into our workplaces because we've talked about the insert specifically looked at your overt um, racism. But we're working in the same uh, environments, right? We're all in the same offices. How are we interacting? Pretty negatively, unfortunately. I mean, after 20 years, one would have hoped there would have been more progress in terms of integration. You know, if I look back 20 years when we first started doing this work, there was definitely far more overt racism. I find it's now a far more, far more covert thing. It's as if we can't talk about race, especially as white people. And until we have this discussion, especially in the workplace, until we negotiate and talk to each other, we're never going to build unity. This is our 20th year of democracy, and we're still hearing about me and my white and my, sorry, red October movement, and me and my little <laughs> colored thing. Why can't we be united? But, but so we need to educate yeah. each other. But it isn't what Sinet saying is that we need, she's talking about the rainbow, but she's saying everybody in there needs to have their own space, and she feels that they don't have their own space. In well, this I think that, you know, they, we have so much space as white people. We have benefited hugely, and we still benefit every day from apartheid. It's nonsense to say we don't. Part of what happens in these conversations, and I spent many years of my life working on gender issues and working as a gender trainer. And so you'd come and have a discussion about what men and women and how women have less power than men. The men in the room would say, but you're not acknowledging the places where you have improved. And it would make feminists, myself included, feel very defensive. But the reality is that if I am not able to acknowledge that as a black person who has um, one of the most fantastic educations in the world, has access and political networks and walks into a room with confidence and will get the CEO position regardless of affirmative, ac affirmative action, right? Mm. If I don't acknowledge that I have power, right, then we're not having an honest conversation. And then yes. Sunet and my brother over here get upset because the reality is there has been an increase of some black people's power. Mm. There has been a new black elite that has formed. So should we then change the way that we do black economic empowerment, change the way that employment equity is done? Maybe. So me and you, Ma who have already benefited, no longer benefit from What it. I'm saying, so I believe in affirmative action, yeah. okay? Because I'm also not, I, I'm not a black person who is so individualistic as to say, my my power and my access means that no one else must have. What I am saying is that a mature conversation on race also recognizes there are different types of power yes. and that there are shades and nuances in the conversation about power. And when I can accept my own privilege that in a new South Africa, the cachet of being an articulate black person mm. has a certain type of power, if I can accept that and acknowledge mm. that, then I can have a conversation with yes. Annette because I've given a little bit of what she's talking about. And then I hope she can also hear me. Right? You agree? I, I, I agree very much with what she's saying. Um, I think it's about owning the truth of your own story with all of its complexity. So for me, as, as again, as an educated middle-class woman, I know that when I walk into spaces, I, I, I carry a certain currency that is not carried by my brother who can't pee in a toilet that I peed in when I went to Vits, exactly. you know? Exactly. But at the same time, I also acknowledge that 
when I do walk into spaces, for example, going into very poor disenfranchised communities, I also have to acknowledge that the dysfunction that I see that exists in those communities is part of my historical baggage. I carry it within me. It's in my family. It's in my heart. It's in my choices. And what is worrisome is seeing people who own so much power in terms of land, in terms of resources, in terms of people you employ, in terms of the language that, you, that you've taken from these people and used to create a nation. You own so much power, but do you concede that? Do you acknowledge that? Do you own that? If, if you own a little bit of that, it would be easy to come to the table with you. It would be easy to acknowledge death is death, pain is pain. I mean, there were 350 years of conscription in this country. It's only one generation of, Af of, of white men who didn't go into the military. How much pain exists in white families? I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to hear that more than I'm willing to hear that your pain is your pain only because everybody in this room is carrying pain. But I don't, I don't believe the debate from our side. 20 years into this democracy, the debate from our side has never been to negate your pain, nor has it ever been about saying that we want back to where we came from. White people voted for this democracy. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't, Sissy. No, we, they didn't. Yes. A handful, in, a in, handful, in a handful. Did, we, any of, did you vote ANC in 1994? I'm not talking any about the ANC. Please listen. In 1992, white people had a referendum to decide whether they're going to allow the vote. And we gave the vote because we thought that what was it happening wasn't was wasn't yours wrong. to give. Do you acknowledge that? It was not your country to take in the first place, but we acknowledge the fact that you are here. We acknowledge that you are here. It wasn't your country to take. Is it your country? It's all of our countries, but it's acknowledge country. it's all of ours. Everybody in this parade are saying we don't belong here. Okay, no one can hear you at this point, so I'd like to actually have a conversation okay. and I'll ask for tolerance in this room, please. Tolerance. All right, Sinet? What I'm saying is that I don't think the problem is with people on the ground, even the people sitting here. People who govern and politicians are determining the success of what is happening on the ground. Right. We have rhetoric where people go on stages and say the colonists must go and, the, and we stole the land and we stole the mines. The, the Brits took the mines. Buddha never had mines. And, and we can't keep on having that rhetoric and move forward. Every time I switch on a television or I put on a radio and Julius Malema says that we don't belong here and what is happening? <laughs> it's a problem. You cannot preach reconciliation to one segment of the country and preach empowerment to the other segment. All right. There's a vast, there's a vast difference between and I agree with you. There's a vast difference between rhetoric that's used to manipulate the population yes. and sway people and the truth. Ne? And I would be interested in hearing how white people process the emotional baggage of what their ancestors did. I would be interested in trying to understand what it did to white families. How much silence did white people have to cope with? How did white people build a shield around themselves to be able to deal with the system in which whiteness operated all these years? That's an emotional conversation. That's a delicate conversation. I'd be willing to do the work of trying to unravel that because right now as a black person, I'm trying to do the work of unraveling my own baggage, my own historical baggage. I think when white people start to do that work, then we'll start to begin the project of trying to understand how all of us belong to this place. But you can't erase history. We can't pretend the violence didn't happen. We can't pretend colonialism didn't happen. We can't pretend people weren't slaves. We can't pretend our people are not poor. It happened. It happened. I'd be willing to hear white people say, you know what, it was cuck trying to pretend that this situation was normal. But I'm not hearing white people do that work. All right. What would that all right. When you were 